Um, towards that end, I am very grateful to all of you individually for having um, agreed to participate in this. And when I introduce you, uh, all of you will see, see that you cover, in fact, not only a vast expanse of South Asia, but you also represent various important particularities of it. To, but before I begin, uh, may I say just a few words, for, especially for our audience who would like to know how they can participate in this uh, event, uh, and a welcome to our audience as well. Um, questions and answers, this is being live streamed now on Facebook. Questions and answers can be asked on Facebook and we will post them. You can ask questions to all speakers. You can ask a generic question. You can ask a question to a specific speaker and we will pose it uh, to them. It's important that I mention that while deciding on the title of this um, discussion, we took a lot of care to ensure that we were very clear about how this was going to be conducted. I'm very well aware of the fact that racism is a wide angled, important and elastic term that is and should be used to describe a gamut of discriminatory practices uh, that stem from various kinds of wellsprings in South Asian societies um, and that we should uh, and and, and it, it applies to, to that variety of, of um, practices, but it is frankly impossible for us to have an exhaustive discussion that covers everything. So as a start, as an initial exercise, uh, I've decided that we will focus in today's discussion on two aspects of racism. They are two traditionally identifiable aspects of racism, and they are two aspects to which South Asians of various hues, when put in non-South Asian contexts, in other contexts, very easily identify as being racist, especially when they are, um, they are, are the victims of it or they are at the receiving end of it. The first is what is called colorism. The whole uh, gamut of practices that covers any kind of behavior that concerns the color of a person, the, uh, the skin color of a person, um, fair skinned versus dark skinned and so on and so forth. The second is not so much about color, but about ethnic features and about ethnic identity. So you may not have a feature which uh, identifies you in any particular way, uh, but you could have an, a name or an ethnic identity that instantly identifies you within your own country as belonging to a particular part. So these are the two things on which uh, we will focus. And these are the two things uh, that I had in mind when I invited uh, the speakers uh, today. It's, this is important because, as I know Malini is going to uh, say in her introductory uh, remarks, there, are, there is a gamut of other things that we rightly should include, uh, but let us try and, and um, begin from here. At the heart of today's discussion is the presumption that when we speak of racism in South Asia, when we speak about colorism or ethnicity-based discrimination, we are speaking about individuals who confront or experience these within their natural or adoptive uh, communities. So uh, these, 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 this, this was an important introductory thing that I wanted to say. The, the, Next thing I want to say is that I wanted to explain uh, that I have invited two uh, speakers who have kindly agreed to join us. Uh, Behruz Shroff, from, uh, who has worked on the Siddhis in, in India, and 
Nerosha Kulasekara, who has worked on the Sri Lankan African community in Sri Lanka. Both Behroz and Nerosha are, do not belong to those communities. They're actually going to speak about what in, in academic parlance we would call their subjects. The only reason I have invited them, and I'm very grateful that they have, uh, they have um, agreed to speak uh, on this panel, uh, is that the only reason I have invited Behroz and, and Nerosha is that it has been almost impossible for me to find speakers from within the communities itself. And that should in itself be an indication of the, the, the historic and the extent of marginalization that has happened uh, to these communities so that we cannot find people who are able to participate in a discussion like this. Uh, so I am particularly grateful to Behroz and to Nerosha because uh, they are not speaking about personal experiences. Separately, I have invited Malini uh, because I, uh, having, having known what Malini does, I, uh, I, I think that Malini will, will be able to bring about a very good uh, wide angled um, beginning and end to this discussion and put it in a larger perspective, in a larger frame, and perhaps even talk about things that we ought to speak about or discuss or where we could, where we could go from here. Finally, uh, before I introduce the speakers, uh, could I just say for the benefit of the um, audience that it is invariable that to have a discussion like this, some words will be used that are acknowledged, recognized as racist words, as racist slurs, as abuse, as forms of discrimination. When they're being used here, they're being used here to make an argument and to make a point and to underline the reality of everyday lived experiences of various people, either in South Asia or in South Asian communities. So I do want to um, mention this at the outset, that there will be some words uh, that are absolutely and admittedly uh, unacceptable and offensive in any context, but are being used here completely for uh, academic purposes of this uh, panel discussion. Uh, it is now my enormous pleasure to introduce all the panelists um, in, in today's discussion. I will introduce them in order of their, um, of, of their appearance, as it were. Uh, Malini Ranganathan is Associate Professor in the School of International Service and is Interim Faculty Director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at the American University in Washington, D.C. We are expecting that Jalila Haider will join us shortly. Uh, she's unable to make a connection, but Jalila has been invited uh, uh, because she is the first woman from the Hazara community. In, and for those of you who may not know amongst the audience, the Hazara community, which is predominant in Quetta in Balochistan, in Pakistan. Um, and she's the first woman lawyer from that community and is the founder of We the Humans Pakistan. She was included in BBC's 100 Women in 2019 and chosen as an International Woman of Courage by the US Department of State in 2020, which is this year. Uh, Nurang Greena is a first generation researcher, writer and activist from Arunachal Pradesh in Northeast India and is currently pursuing her PhD at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi in India. Kulmat Ali Shah was until recently postdoctoral research fellow at Ryerson University in Toronto, and from the 1st of November will join Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario uh, at, in a postdoctoral capacity. I qualify Queen's University as Kingston, Ontario because there's one in Belfast here as well. Suya Danartun, special thanks to her because she is actually in tomorrow. She's in Adelaide in Australia and it's past midnight. So thank you very much, Sue. Uh, Suya Danartun is one of the organizers of the Don't Call Me the K Word campaign and a feminist advocate in uh, Rangoon in Myanmar, currently studying in Adelaide. And a special thanks to you for staying up so late to participate in this event. 
Nirosha Kulasekara is student counselor at the University of Colombo and has worked closely with Sri Lankan Africans for several years, including being a translator for the community at various academic events. Behrouz Shroff is lecturer in Asian American studies at the University of California, Irvine, and her research focuses on the Siddhi community in India. Last, but certainly not the least, Gurpreet Kaur is a writer and young activist who advocates for multicultural inclusion within the Sikh community and leads the Black Sikh Initiative about which she will speak uh, later on. So without further ado, may I invite Malini to make her opening remarks. Uh, Malini, you have between five and seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nilanjan and the LSC South Asia Center for organizing this really important panel. I'm very grateful to be part of it and I'm looking forward to listening to and engaging with my fellow panelists. I speak today as a South Asian immigrant living in Washington DC as a scholar who seeks to expose and dismantle racism and injustice, especially pertaining to urban housing and the environment. And as the interim faculty director of American News Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. The question posed of us all today are South Asians racist? No doubt serves as a type of rhetorical device designed perhaps to elicit not whether South Asians are racist. That much I think is clear. Many South Asians are racist and racism and related forms of structural and interpersonal prejudice, notably ethnic bigotry and colorism are widespread in the region. To me, rather, this question is meant to elicit discussion on how and to what ends racism exists in South Asia. I'd like to first discuss two of the most major forms of racism and ethnic bigotry in India. Um, that is anti-Northeast Indian racism and anti-Black racism. And then I'd like to consider racism uh, in this context alongside the broadly related formations of caste, ethnic bigotry, colorism, and Islamophobia. I will make a case for why the analytic of racialization connects these various forms of discrimination and oppression across the South Asian region. In January 2014, 19-year-old Nido Taniam, a college student from Arunachal Pradesh, got into a brawl with local shopkeepers in Delhi's Lajpat Nagar. The argument began when Taniam asked for directions. In return, the shopkeepers insulted him and his appearance with racial slurs. Many of you are likely familiar with the specific set of commonplace slurs against people from India's Northeast region. More recently, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, the words corona and virus have been used as slurs against Northeasterners, a trend no doubt fueled by chauvinist political leaders. Unfortunately for Taniam, the argument quickly escalated into violence, and later that night, Taniam died from grave injuries. Black geographer and abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore defines racism in plain enough terms as, quote, the state or extra legally sanctioned group mediated vulnerabilities to premature death, end quote. In India and in South Asia, like elsewhere, racism kills. Taniam's death sparked solidarity protests among youth, not just from Arunachal, but also from surrounding Northeast states who share common Himalayan borderland identities. Protesters called for an anti-racism bill to address India's hate crimes. That is precisely what that was, since current legislation does not recognize racial discrimination. The bill did not come to pass but the incident squarely thrust the vocabulary of racism long brushed under the carpet into the public spotlight. Scholars Mabel Gergan and Sarah Smith, who have been conducting ethnographic research on the experience of Ladakhi youth when they migrate from the Himalayan borderlands to metropolitan centers in quote, mainland India, discuss how the transition to city life for such youth can be precarious and contradictory. What these youth experience is, in a nutshell, severe forms of othering, humiliation, and racialization, even as they negotiate newfound economic, cultural, and social freedoms. There's a very important gender discrimination dimension here too, 
as women from Northeast India are not just targets of sexual violence in a heavily militarized border region, but are also sexualized and targeted for gender-based violence in India's metropolitan areas. In May 2016, under tragically similar circumstances, Masanda Ketada Olivier, a 23-year-old Congolese student, died after a racist altercation with auto drivers in Delhi. Mob violence against youth, especially from Nigeria and Ghana, are widespread in India's cities. Bangalore, in southern India, where I focus my research, for instance, is a popular destination for students from Nigeria and Ghana, and students from these areas are routinely roughed up. Everyday anti-Black racism in South Asia means that blackface and derogatory slurs are commonplace in Bollywood, as well as the cultural appropriation and exoticization of an undifferentiated and supposedly primitive African culture. These are not isolated incidents. These are part of a culture, structure, and silence that normalizes racism and ethnic bigotry and colorism. However, as seen, for instance, by the lynchings against beef-eating Dalits and Muslims over the past six years, it is important to keep in mind that anti-Northeastern and anti-Black racism are manifest precisely because they are parasitic and extant with formations of colonialism, casteism, ethnicity, colorism, and religious bigotry, all of which provide the bedrock of discrimination, in India at least, in a Hindu majoritarian, ethno-nationalist, Brahmin supremacist and fairness obsessed polity. My larger point is that racism in South Asia and among South Asian communities in Britain and US as well is entangled with formations of discrimination that are not structured strictly by race. To speak to the peculiar intersectionalities present in South Asia, right? Sureshi Jayawardene has referred to the experience of Africana descendant groups the Siddhis and Kafirs, who we'll hear about later today, as racialized casteism. So the analytic point I want to make is that South Asia presents a peculiar set of entanglements and intersectionalities between racism, ethnic bigotry, colorism, and other extant formations of discrimination. I think it's really important that we keep those in view when we discuss the manifestation of racism in South Asia. I'll end just by bringing up the analytic of racialization first deployed by the anti-colonial activist and scholar Frantz Fanon. Racialization, as I understand it, refers to the continuous process of ascription, whereby humans are grouped and self-group themselves according to assigned physical and cultural traits that are assumed to be natural, but that are in fact deeply shaped by the unequal distribution of power, resources, and knowledge. So I'll just put that on the table as an analytic that I found really useful. Um, and I'll close here for now and really hope to engage in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malini. That was um, very, very useful for, for all of us. Um, I, will, I will come back to you. I can tell you right now, so you have about an hour to think about this, but I will come back to you. Uh, to ask you about the whole question of the routinization and normalization of, of racism and the entangled uh, ways in which you're talking about it, and also how so much of it is routinized through apparent humor or what is supposed to be humor and a joke or, or worse as, as forms of affection. But, but we'll come, come to that because uh, they are more disturbing sides of our uh, of a certain practiced social and, and, and civic culture. Uh, Jalila Haider, for those of you who were perhaps waiting to hear her, I'm afraid she has still not been able to um, join in, but uh, could I then ask uh, Nurang Rina, uh, as I, for those of you who might have missed it at the beginning, if you've joined in late, uh, Nurang Rina is a first generation researcher, a writer and activist from Arunachal Pradesh in Northeast India and is currently pursuing her doctoral research at the Center for European Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi in India. Narang Rina, it's your turn now, thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I think we come together at, at such an uncertain uh, time and uh, to, to arrange this uh, discussion on racism, I think it's 
has never been more important than now. Um, I thank Professor Nilanjan for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel with esteemed and distinguished uh, scholars, activists, and um, artists. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Malini, for opening the floor with those thoughts. I think uh, I reconcile with most of your ideas and the picture that you presented to the audience about what happens in India um, with the Northeast population and the, the kind of discrimination and racism that the people of Northeast Indians face. Um, I would like to begin with the question, are South, South Asians racist? But I would like to bring the question to my home, which is India. Are Indians racist? Um, there is a myth and people like to glorify that sentence, which says um, India is a very peaceful country. <clears throat> there is unity in diversity. I would like to uh, contest that statement and tell that uh, in the last 28 years of my existence in this country, I may not uh, have come to terms with that statement. Uh, as we speak, the a 19 year old Dalit has been raped and murdered. Um, a lot of uh, Muslim scholars and activists are jailed today. Uh, I think uh, this, this country has uh, come to a point where we need to call out uh, that there is a systemic violence that is taking place. Um, to come back to, uh, if I know what racism is, if, people, if, if there are still questions and doubts about if India is a racist country, let me tell you, how do I know if uh, racism exists in India? Racism is most often felt, experienced, and almost impossible to describe or recall in a political language of the law. Uh, in that sense, everyday form of racism are more experiential rather than an objectively identified situation. This, my friend, is, uh, or, or rather has been uh, stories for many of us from the Northeastern region in, in the metros uh, of, of India. Uh, Professor Malini also distinguished the kind of racism that we exist and we have, uh, we have theoretically identified Systemic racism, what is systemic racism? Uh, institutional racism that we talk about is biases inferred into policies or laws uh, as well as in its practice, such as an enforcement of judicial system. Um, I think in India's picture, uh, uh, you, you might have heard of many instances where a lot of academics really struggle to get into good positions in a teaching university or um, even as a student, as a, as, a doctoral, uh, as a doctoral student, because there are certain, I think, norms and practices that exist and does not really accommodate uh, uh, in individuals from certain communities. Um, then, then, then there are everyday kind of racism that we often feel, see, but again, we are not able to conceptualize in, in everyday language, which is the interpersonal racism which is external representations of bigotry and biases shown between individuals, such as racist remarks, slurs, or any kind of physical display of discrimination. Uh, I would like to bring in my experiences that, have, that, that I have had over the years. Uh, slurs such as chinky, Chinese, uh, in the recent times, corona virus, um, and, and there are very vulgar uh, slurs that are put, especially for women. Uh, I'm not sure if I can use that here, but I think with your permission, I would like to use it. We are called, or I have been called many times, a slut, a prostitute on my face because I happen to um, display that character for some reason for most of Indians. Um, then, then we can talk about internalized racism which is not necessarily displaying an external representation, but I think it is something that is within every individual due to their belonging to a systematically, systemic, sorry, systemically racist society. Uh, to, to really validate or answer to the question of is, uh, or are Indians racist, uh, 
I don't have to look far. I think my experiences uh, as, as a writer, researcher, and an activist myself have allowed me to have, uh, you know, uh, ideas about the vast reality that has um, taken place. Since 2009 that I've moved from Arunachal to New Delhi as, as an aspiring uh, student to get into uh, a good educational institute, I think I, I, I would, it would be fair to say that almost every episode of incident uh, made me pack my ba uh, bags and you know, come back home. Uh, I was denied housing uh, for assuming to be a loose character woman. Uh, in January 2015, my friends and I were denied entry into a hotel in Jaipur, which is in R India's Rajasthan. The manager demanded that uh, we prove our nationality. Uh, either that was through speaking Hindi or by our passport, I'm not sure. Um, so we left the hotel disappointed. Uh, in 2017, June, I had gone to visit a friend at a hotel in the evening and uh, there were a couple of men who misbehaved with me at the hotel lobby, calling me or assuming me to be slapped again. And uh, when I re resorted to calling the police and asking them to file a complaint. It wasn't, I wasn't surprised, but I think uh, that is something that needs to be uh, brought out to the audience. The police denied uh, taking the complaint because again, I was asked if I was at the wrong place with the wrong, 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 with wrong company. And the, the police also inquired if I was, uh, I, I had consumed alcohol. So I think these are the many facets of, uh, say, character assassination that also comes along, uh, you know, with the ethnic identity that I I have. Um, then, as I think uh, Professor Malin has, uh, uh, you know, presented so well about how in 2015 a young boy from Arunachal Pradesh, Tanya, was brutally murdered. Uh, I think it was for the first time a big political movement happened in terms of, uh, you know, identifying the race problem in India. Because, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think before that, the talk or conversation on race has always been a hush-hush, uh, you know, closed door conversation. Um, people are in denial. Uh, there is no acknowledgement, let alone uh, the, the fact that, uh, that the existing uh, uh, police laws do not even, you know, accommodate that uh, atrocities into, uh, you know, take, take, does not even take into account that. Um, a girl from Manipur in New Delhi was raped by his neighbor. Um, and uh, later the man admitted that he raped because the woman from Manipur seemed very nice and that she had smiled and he, he was under the assumption that it was an invitation. Um, um, I think that again needs to be highlighted that she is a woman, uh, she, she, she has an ethnic identity um, and, and that must have played quote unquote, uh, you know, um, wrong for her. Um, then during the COVID-19 as, as uh, you know, as, as Professor Malini has again pointed out, the, the number of cases that rose, uh, not just in terms of uh, calling out names, but even basic rights such as access to food was denied. A lot of people could not get into uh, shops uh, because they were kicked out of the, uh, you know, supermarket saying this, this is not your place. Uh, I remember connecting and coordinating with you know, a lot of uh, civil society organizations, lawyers, activists, and trying to help them out. But I think the point is, uh, this is something that again, we, I need to highlight to the audience that you, you know, the later recourse to, you know, just such help is, is nothing when at that point in time, you're told you don't belong to this country, this sense of indignity and harassment that one has to endure. I think that is something that needs to be highlighted. Um, I think a couple of years back, again, another incident comes to my mind. A, a woman from Manipur again was uh, 
was asked to prove his nationality at Delhi's international airport. I think he was, she was asked to sing a national anthem while she was boarding a flight. Uh, then I think another incident that I recall is a group of young girls or boys, I think, yeah, students from Assam had gone for a visit to uh, Agra Taj Mahal. And there again, uh, all of them were denied entry, uh, asking them again to prove their identity. Um, then the another important aspect that I would like to highlight, if I have time, is about uniform sure. power and violence. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so Sorry to interrupt you, but if you could uh, finish in about a minute and then we'll come back to you because you've raised some very uh, important and some very, through some very disturbing examples. I can't say I was unaware of them, but it still sounds, it doesn't make it any better when I hear it said again. Uh, but if you could uh, take another minute and just talk about the violence aspect of it and we'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important point that I would like to stress today is about uh, the uniform power and violence in the Northeast. Uh, this political strategy of criminalizing the entire race with the presence of armed forces in the Northeast, or some of the, some of the states in the Northeast, I think is one of the most, uh, I think, rigid, I think, a display of you know, power and violence and an and act of racism towards the region. And this is something that many don't call out and that, that needs to be, uh, I think, uh, really, really need to be highlighted. Um, so uh, as I conclude, uh, my, my question is to the other speakers and also to the audience that I want to leave behind is, what are the impacts of such tragic experiences? Uh, you know, we may often get swayed away by all these uh, questions on what is racism and how do we define it, uh, especially in an academic environment. But, uh, you know, the, the very basic but most important question that we need to all deal with is such traumatic, traumatic events corroborate old wounds. And these insecurities I know from experience impede us from living a free life. And together they often compel us to have a distorted view of the world and look at it as unfair and unjust. And I think most of us, we fear to express our desires, we fear our aspirations, and many of us dream with inhibitions. Um, to borrow the famous uh, lines from King Martin Luther Jr., I have a dream. I think uh, in, in the lines of that, I would like to conclude that maybe uh, one day we shall all rise above these, uh, you know, barriers and uh, hope of a hope, hope of, a, of a country, a region, or a world that is free from all sort of hatred and bigotry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuran. Irina. Um, I I should make one factual clarification, which is that at, at the start of your uh, of your presentation, you mentioned this the, the very, very tragic episode that has happened between the um, day before yesterday and yesterday in Hatras in India uh, with this uh, Dalit girl. Uh, and you said uh, that, that she had been raped and, and she had been murdered. I think uh, she died from, from the, 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 the wounds of it. I mean, she wasn't murdered. Uh, she was. Uh, if, I, I may, I, if I may interrupt, I use the word murder in a very uh, I use the word murderer, sorry, murdered very carefully because I think, uh, because, because I think it, it is the result of uh, an upper caste, uh, you know, a violation and discrimination. And I see that as maybe, maybe, I mean, I mean, I, I may be wrong in that way in, in illegal terms, but I, I see that it is because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, her, her identity as a Dalit and, and the perpetrator's identity as an upper caste solely uh, legitimizes the concept of murder for me. And, and sure, sure. I, and, and you're absolutely right, right in thinking so. Uh, what I was actually uh, doing was simply clarifying a technical point for a lot of people because, uh, you know, this is an international audience who may actually take your word literally. I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying, but I, that was the only reason I was... Uh, I, I, was, I sought to clarify it 
Um, I will come back to you because uh, you made a point and you made a point repeatedly, uh, and it's a point that I am aware of as well, about the whole question of um, seeing women from Northeast India in other parts of India as, I'm going to be careful about what word I use, as somehow being of loose morals. Uh, and you used stronger words, no doubt words that have been used for you. And as you said from your examples that they are, uh, you have also had direct experiences, not only with people in a hotel lobby, but also with institutional groups like the police. Um, and it will be, I think it is worth exploring uh, and, and discussing openly why this association is made. Yeah. And uh, just as it is important to wonder about why it is, and this is an eternal question in my mind, is why is it that people of your country are unable to recognize you as being one of their own? Why, what are the mental associations that they make unconsciously, not about you or not just about you based on your ethnic features, but about what they see to be an Indian to look like? Because there is no one look that an Indian has. Right? And at the same time, this prejudice is coming from mental associations of what they are associating you with. Right? That is at the core of the, of the problem. Um, but, but if we could uh, go to Hurmat, uh, um, and, and I will uh, introduce Hurmat again. Hurmat Ali Shah was until recently postdoctoral research fellow at Ryerson University, Toronto and will from November be joining Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario as a postdoctoral fellow. Hulma, before you begin to speak, could you just say a couple of sentences for the benefit of the audience about the context from which you are speaking in the context of Pakistan? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, very much for inviting me. Uh, so before, I speak, uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, as uh, you can feel uh, that uh, um, I'm a stammerer and uh, so because of my stammering, there can be some issues, but if you do, don't understand something because of my stammering, uh, so you can always interrupt and I, I, I will uh, repeated. Uh, uh, so we are, I'm coming from uh, basically, I'm coming from uh, uh, the Pashtun context in Pakistan. Uh, when we talk about racism in, 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 in uh, South, South Asian uh, countries and in particular in Pakistan, so, so it uh, uh, becomes like a very and a very complicated thing. Uh, when we talk about uh, the North America, the Europe and so on, so there we can see that there is a black community, a brown community, and then there are the whites. So there uh, you, you can see that uh, the racism, you can uh, see them in, in, in the law books, you can feel them in the structures of land and so on. But uh, it, in our societies, particularly in Pakistan, uh, 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 there is a, like one claim of a nationhood on the basis of Islam. So, 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 so when you go there and when you see so, so you will not be able to uh, uh, prove uh, uh, in a kind of that, 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 that any community, be that Pashtuns or be that uh, Sindhis or be that Baloch and so on, like they uh, are facing a <laughs> Racism. And, and, 
And to a certain extent, all of these communities, all of these ethnicities, Pashtuns, Baloch, and so on, they are part of the power structure. So uh, uh, the, uh, the argument against racism uh, uh, can be said that okay, uh, you are saying that uh, Pashtuns face a lot of racism, but then it would be said that uh, this minister's, uh, minister is a Pashtun, uh, the Pashtun holds this amount of uh, of uh, the officer and so on. So uh, uh, these kind of things in the context of Pakistan becomes very complicated and they also very uh, uh, along a line. Uh, uh, the ethnic oppression and uh, the racism which a uh, few uh, uh, communities face of, for example, the Hazaras in Balochistan, it can be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, equated is uh, with a state-sponsored ch genocide, and and that is not because of their ethnic identity, but uh, but uh, because of their uh, sect, uh, uh, because they are Shia, and so uh, because of their sect, they are conflated in, 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 like, in, in like a very narrow uh, locality in a crater, and they are like a very easy target for the uh, uh, for, for the Sunni fanatics. Uh, so, but on the other hand, uh, when we uh, come to talk, uh, so, 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 uh, so what I'm trying to say, there is that uh, uh, when it comes to the racism and the oppression that uh, the communities like Hazara face, it is uh, uh, visible and it's like uh, the most awesome and uh, it is equivalent to like a state sponsored genocide. But on the other hand, the, the racism and the discrimination which the Pashtuns face is like uh, uh, very hard to spot. Uh, the the first reason for that is uh, uh, because Pashtuns uh, are the second uh, 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 biggest ethnicity in Pakistan. So, so like they, uh, the the sheer size of uh, of the population uh, 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 make them to occupy like a vast of geographical area from uh, the north to the south and then to like the main metropolitans. And so, uh, uh, and then uh, because of uh, 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 the size of the Pashtuns and, and, and then the, and then, uh, the associated uh, geopolitics in, in Afghanistan, uh, the Pakistan state has in a lot of ways co-opted uh, some parts, uh, uh, sections and classes of uh, 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 the Pashtun population. So like uh, the Pashtuns are like the junior stakeholders uh, uh, in the state project of Pakistan. But but on the other hand, uh, there has always been uh, 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 an unconscious threat in, in, in the making of the identity of Pakistan and in the structure of Pakistanis from uh, the Pashtuns. So uh, whenever we uh, <laughs> talk about who uh, 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 the Pakistani is and uh, and uh, in contrast to whom that Pakistani is constructed, uh, uh, the other is always the Pashtun. Like so. Uh, we can see that in uh, uh, in the media, uh, 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 there are only two kind of representations of Pashtuns in the media. They are either uh, the violent and they are whether uh, either like, like like the violent beasts and uh, the jihadis and uh, the terrorists and uh, Taliban and so on. Are they like very simpletons? They're like fools and like they are they, these. Uh, 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 caricatures and uh, uh, the, the, uh, in our attire or 
culture this and uh, the uh, the way we speak uh, Urdu uh, and, and like uh, or, or accent of Urdu, like it is used as as an instrument of caricature. So uh, 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 here I, I'm saying to this argument that uh, uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the the very identity of a, a de-ethnicized Pakistani is constructed uh, uh, via opposing it to uh, uh, the ethnicized Pashtun. So uh, uh, this is not, not only uh, uh, we experience in uh, in the, the, the society uh, uh, because of uh, the, the racism, but also in the uh, state-sponsored uh, projects. Of, for, for example, in uh, the propaganda videos of uh, uh, the ISPR, ISPR is uh, the inter Public uh, Relations, uh, 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 which is like uh, 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 the <laughs> of uh, uh, the Pakistani military, but, but in particular of the Pakistan army. So uh, here, uh, as we all know, for, for, for the last 10 to 15 years, there have been uh, operations against uh, uh, the militants <laughs> Going on. So, in all uh, the propaganda videos which are made by the ISPR, uh, uh, the militants, the Taliban, are always shown in, in, in the Pashtun attire and in, in speaking like uh, in immaculate Pashto. On the other hand, the uh, and then they, they obviously are the evil. On the other hand, uh, uh, the Pakistan army officers are, are shown to be those uh, clean shaven, uh, uh, the, the urban Pakistanis who can speak uh, immaculate Urdu, uh, Urdu and English. So uh, uh, the, these kind of things are picked up again and again by, by, uh, uh, by the media too. And as a result of these state-sponsored and state-structured racism, uh, the Pashtuns uh, face a lot of discrimination in the uh, uh, in it is all, all over Pakistan. Uh, the reason for that is uh, because of the economic exploitation and, and uh, the racism which has been going on since uh, the inception of Pakistan. Uh, Pashtuns have been forced to migrate into uh, um, uh, uh, the bigger uh, cities. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 Karachi and, and that uh, the the rate of uh, the migration is increased uh, because of the operations uh, 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 because all of the Pashtun lands uh, fr from uh, Balochistan uh, to to what was ex further to uh, now the Khyber <laughs> Pashtun like they are the theater of uh, 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 the war and terrorism so so the people have been forced. To to my, I get to Islamabad, Rawalpindi, Lahore, and Karachi, and there, uh, there is then uh, 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 the police circulars going on, which uh, 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 instruct uh, the markets to look out for Pashtuns. Uh, uh, there, uh, a particular. Excellent uh, uh, will be of note here. Uh, in 2018, uh, an uh, aspiring uh, Pashtun model who had um, migrated from Waziristan to Karachi uh, was abducted by uh, the police and then he was killed in a fake. Encountered and then he uh, and then he was uh, shown uh, to to, uh, to be um latent. But uh, the fact was that he was very popular on the Facebook and he has uh, around 22, 25,000 of, of, of followers on Facebook uh, uh, because of his interest in um, modeling. So that caught some fire and that got some attention and. Uh, because of that uh, killing, a movement was born, which is called uh, Pashtun Tahafuz Movement, uh, 
uh, uh, the movement for the protection of Pashtuns. So uh, over the last two or three years, uh, they, uh, um, movement is facing a lot of oppression, that is facing a lot of uh, discrimination and, 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 and state uh, sanctioned violence. So um, uh, 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 I took conclude uh, by uh, uh, saying that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the racism which uh, uh, the Pashtuns face in Pakistan is of a very pe peculiar uh, uh, variety. They are uh, at the same time, uh, both inside the structure of the state and at the periphery of the state. So uh, at some classes, some section of the Pashtuns are the junior partner in the state, while the majority of the Pashtuns are, are, are the victims are, are, and they are oppressed by the policies and by the uh, and, uh, and the so-called war on uh, terrorism, uh, which is reached by uh, the Pakistani state. Thank you very much. For, just to, to start with, you were absolutely clear. So uh, no, no concerns on that, that ground we've understood. Thank you also, especially for bringing to light another very important aspect of the whole uh, question of racism in South Asia, something that is not limited to Pakistan alone, but to various other countries, which is that a discriminated community or a minority community, not necessarily discriminated, but a minority community can be both part of the mainstream and yet be marginalized at the same time. Uh, and and it, it functions in various ways. It functions within communal paradigms. Uh, it, it, it functions within caste paradigms and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm now going to ask um, Suya Danartun to, to speak, Sue is one of the organizers of the Don't Call Me the K-Word campaign uh, and is a feminist advocate in Rangoon in Myanmar and is currently studying in Adelaide in, in Australia. Um, so I, 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 without, without any further ado, but with the request that Sue, if you could explain for the benefit of the audience, what is referred to when you say the K-Word, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Nilanjan, and thank you, LSE Center. Um, I personally believe that nobody is born racist. It is something that's taught by the society and the environment that we grew up in. So today I'm going to talk about the K word, which is Gala, that goes to men, and Galama, that goes for women, uh, that's happening in. Myanmar, it's a racial slur, yet people are ignorant about how uh, this word affects uh, many people in the background. So I would like to start off with the campaign that I just uh, started running with uh, two of my friends in June uh, called Don't Call Me K Word. So it's run by my two friends and it's uh, we started by uh, profile pictures. Uh, which labeled don't call me Kala for men, don't call me Kalama for women, and I don't call somebody Kala or Kalama, which is for um, people that actually support the campaign. So we started off with that, and we have some important purposes, uh, which are firstly, um, to give awareness to the people how this word is a racial slur and how it impacts people in a bad way. So the second of, uh, it's to measure and analyze the level of racism happening in the whole country. And third of to reach out to the people who have been uh, the same situation, uh, just like us, and to actually understand their situations, to let them express their feelings and to understand more about their perceptions towards the work. So coming off to the history part, it is, the K word, it's a bit controversial because um, some people say it derived from a Hindi Urdu word Kala, which means black. So the second um, history of the word is to be Kula in Bali, um, which means 
it's defined in the Bali Myanmar dictionary too. So it means noble race or a family. So uh, around 2000 years ago, when uh, the foreigners entered Myanmar, people used that gula, gula word as a family, as a relative that uh, Myanmar people, Burmese people used to have respect on. So the third, um, the third um, history behind the word is gula, which means in Burmese means um, the foreigners that entered Myanmar at that time. The foreigners consist uh, of not only Indians or Bengalis, but also other um, Westerners. So the, that's why I've ha how these um, um, non-living things in Myanmar, galatine, galabe, galatine means chair, galabe means um, some sort of pea that we used to cook, and galaga, which means shelter. So these are the words that is um, um, assumed to have used or to have um, introduced by these uh, foreigners that entered Burma 2000 years ago. But over time, the intention of people using the word towards people, it has changed. It is now used towards another person just to downgrade the person based on the skin color, based on the race, ethnicity, religion, etc. So the question is, who is calling the K word towards these people? Mostly it is Burmese people, including other major ethnic cities in Myanmar, but they used to downgrade other people. So the kala, kalama, that's used towards anybody who has um, darker shades of skin color or the faith or the eth ethnicity. But the sad truth is that um, not only Burmese people, not only other major ethnicities in Burma use the word, but also the sad truth is that the we as Indians, we as South Asia descendants in Myanmar started also using the word just to normalize, just to fit in the society. So it is not only the Burmese people that use the word anymore, it is the whole society using the word. So it's um, completely normalized and it's like an okay thing, which is not okay. So when it comes to my personal experience, I grew up in both state schools and international schools, but no matter how much I paid to those schools, no matter how grand the schools were, I was always being discriminated just because of my health ethnicity. My dad is Shan, Shan Chinese, which is not Burmese. I have no Burmese blood, but yeah, my dad is Shan Chinese and my mom is Punjabi Sikh. So just because I have this health ethnicity and just because I had um, darker skin shade, people used to call me Kala, Kalama and they won't let me um, participate in class activities like group projects or um, as a kid, they won't let me play with them too. But then my close friends, my best friends, they tried to stand up um, on behalf of me. They were like, no, don't call her Kal Kalama because she is only half Indian. So that thing, it. It was solved that time, but as I grew up and as I grew older and older, as I educated myself, um, to, the way my friends, I mean, I understood as a kid, but the way they stood up for me, she's only half Indian, don't call her that. So it is completely wrong because um, where did my half ethnicity go? So as a child, I don't have much experience to talk about it, but I have a lot of these small um, incidents that happened to me using the K word. So as a kid, that's very unbearable for me to hear the K word. So it dragged to the point where I don't even mention my health ethnicity to the people anymore. I'm like, uh, yes, I am Shan Chinese, that's it. But they're like, oh, you don't look like Wang. I'm like, no, it's just like that. So I was very ashamed of who I was. I did not know how this word has impacted on a lot of people. So, and other people, including um, Indians. Um, I identify as Punjabi too. Yeah. So these people, what happened is that they started to normalize the word. So it is like an okay thing to for them to be called as well. So it's like, yeah, call me, I don't care. It is like that. But it may be okay to use the word towards uh, the family, to the friends as another normal word, but we have to be alert. We have to be aware that this word is derogatory to many people and it can affect individually or as a group. So I will actually like to end my um, talk that it is 
all about mutual respect. Even if it's not about racism, it's all about mutual respect. Mutual respect stays too. So all these non-living things in Myanmar, like Galatang, Galabe, Galaga, they are not meant to be changed. They are non-living things. They don't have feelings. I'm stating here because people are very offended by the word, including me, and some people who did not have a chance to go to school or things like that, they are now working in the streets, Indian kids um, in my street as well. They're working in the streets, like uh, people call them casually just to, you know, like just for the random um, chores, house chores, like pay them and everything. So every, all these street, all these people, they call the kid Galali, which means Gala, like, the, the way that I mentioned. But then he understood the word that it actually uh, shaped him as a whole. He, he didn't understand that this word is a racial slur. He thought, oh, it was just my identity. He did not know how to act upon that. He was like, oh, okay, I'm gala. So these kids, they don't even know how to react on them and they don't they actually started to normalize the word and identify themselves as Kala and be uh, inferior to all these people in Myanmar. So it's all about mutual respect. And if you have a mutual respect, I think um, most of the problems are solved. So I would like to transfer you for another discussion. Thank you very much, Suya Danari. It was, that, was, that, was very, that was very good because I don't think um, a lot of the others who have spoken till now have spoken about experiences during their school life. Um, and, and that is important because it's important to draw attention to how unfortunately, how early all this begins, because what you are talking about is not just your own experiences, but also how other children who are also children of your age are already socialized into using this kind of a linguistic structure. And, and that, you know, that is both evidence of the routinization and normalization of it on the one hand, and on the other hand, of how it should never become so. That it, it shouldn't, it, it should never um, be so. Uh, we will, of course, come back to you. Thank you very much. Um, could I now uh, request Nerosha Nirosha Kulasekara, who is student counselor at the University of Colombo and has worked cl very closely with the Sri Lankan uh, African community um, for several years uh, and has also, I know from others, uh, been translator for the, for, for the community and people from the community at various academic events. But before Nirosha begins, uh, for those of our audience who have been here from the start, uh, Malini, when she was speaking, referred to, to a, a variety of words that are used to refer to, to, to um, co-citizens um, of, of African uh, descent in Sri Lanka, in India. And one of the words that uh, Malini used was kafir. Now that the word obviously comes originally from Arabic and from being infidel and non-believer, but actually comes into South Asian uh, linguistics from European and, and English and Latin and, and in the case of Sri Lanka Portuguese uh, use, usage of the word kafre. Uh, and it is worth actually looking at the etymology of the journey of the word itself as it has moved, uh, the, the word on its own has actually moved from, from, from an Islamic territory into a Catholic territory to be used as a referent for not just an entire group and community of people, but also a reference to people who have a certain kind of skin color. And it's very useful to bring Nirosha in at this point because um, Suya Danars, um, what, what, what she said uh, brings us or, or takes us away from the whole question of of racism and discrimination based on ethnic features that we have been talking about now, or of ethnicity, as in the case of Pashtuns, to literally what is obvious and apparent to the eye, that is the color of the skin. Uh, Nirosha. Thank you, Dr. Nair. I think I'm clear. Okay, so uh, if I'm to talk about Sri Lanka and the racism, there's plenty, but I'm going to stick just to the African community in Sri Lanka. 
uh, which whom I call Afro Sri Lankans. But yeah, true, they have been called Kafirs or Kafirs. So that is the issue that was addressed very recently. If you take the historical uh, research that is done on the African Sri Lankans, they were referred as Kafirs for years. And I mean, there are even books written about them, referring to them as Kafirs. So even they themselves call themselves Kapiri in singular, or Kapiri, uh, Kafir, Kaberi, both ways in Tamil. And uh, what happened here was that they thought it was their identity, their ethnic identity was to be called Kafirs. They had no idea in the first place that it is a derivative term. Until very recently, when another researcher, Professor Lionel Mandy, reached their community and told them that in Africa, it is a derivative term. So thereafter, they changed their identity to African Sri Lankan. And only the recent research from Professor Mandy, of course, Dr. Sureshi, and myself, our research re re referred them as Sri Lankan Africans. But they were called Kafirs before. And most of the research, if you go up on the net, you will see them as Kafirs. And even one point, there is an article called Sing Without Shame, that they themselves were regarded as uh, taking the word kafir as a nice way of calling themselves because they had no idea, maybe. So anyway, to take uh, racism into the whole story, I think we should talk about the skin color mostly because in Sri Lanka, the skin color does have a racist uh, issue because we as Indians or post-colonial communities, the fairer skin, the white skin is always regarded as something hierarchy. So just like Zoo was talking, we also have a word for dark skin, Kalu, right? So anybody who's Kalu is regarded a uh, little lower than the others. So there is a racism, racistic whole idea, concept behind that. So in Sri Lanka, even the normal Sri Lankans, of course, they are not uh, Europeans. Still, we are more close to Indians. Still, the lighter skins have the better chances in society. So then again, this being dark skin in normal Sri Lankan community is an issue. Whereas when it comes to Sri Lankan Africans, who still have most of their skin color left in some of them, and they have as well, have a issue with the racist and ethnic differences. Because uh, although there is a community of Africans, they are merging with the normal society or Sri Lankan society, Sinhalese or Tamil societies and the community. So when you take the third or the fourth generation, the skin color, the hair, the fe facial features have changed. But then again, there are few who have still got the same African features remaining. And some of them do not want to be recognized as African. That is the issue because of the skin and the hair and the African features. And to be called Kapiri, which they believe is a derogatory term now. And also kind of hiding it from the society because they are darker, because they look different. And they not that they behave different or anything, but they just look different. So they have that issue with them. And however, I don't want to put them down as dark skins or racist, uh, racially discriminated people because modern community there has found a way out of it. They have found that uh, they are singing, which they continue their uh, African manja music in their, uh, as one of their main community identification, also as a part of making a living. In that, they have started to uh, highlight the African descendancy. And lucky for them, Professor Lionel Mandy and myself and Dr. Sureshi has been able to bring them out in the society. And previously, uh, there's a, one great scholar called Professor Jai Surya, Chehan Silva Jai Surya. She has written extensively about them and few videos on the internet as well. And most recently, I am happy to say that the South African High Commissioner on Sri Lanka has taken a special interest in this community and she has taken great effort to support this community through our research and reading through our research and the work and get, going to meet them herself personally. She has 
gone into their community meet them and started empowering them and making sure that being african or having darker skin is not derogatory or racially different that they are better and they are highlighted and their importance is given and they are empowered and um, there is even one girl in the community who's an absolute beauty who thinks that she has to wait until she finds another african to get married so the color and the skin and all that remains in the community before that they were kind of thinking of intermarrying into the uh singular or tamil community so their skin and their hair will disappear and they were willing to do that now they are changing however when we did our research there were a few uh, families who didn't want even to be mentioned in the research because they thought being called kapi or recognized as a african name a sri lankan was derogatory so there was an issue there still is an issue but i hope the new generation are changing and they are admiring their own beauty of being kafirs or african sri lankans or even called kalu and they are now emerging as a very strong ethnic community in sri lanka as afro sri lankan and their music and their dance and their community is now getting highlighted also thankful to this uh, african south african high commissioner who is supporting them extensively on this whole project on empowering them so hopefully they'll have a better future and this uh, racial discrimination will disappear in time but then again when it comes to academia if you refer them as african sri lankan there'll be very few but if you refer to them as kafirs there'll be plenty so that is that still remains so and anyway because as a counselor also i don't like to discriminate people or bring too much about the discrimination that's going on i think uh, empowering them and showing the true beauty of kalu is much better than uh, getting them discriminated because in sri lanka kala is not the only issues because we have plenty of racial discriminations ethnic discriminations and all that and then again we are supposed to be the island paradise we are better than that so hopefully we will have a better future thank you thank you very much um nerosha um for for speaking on behalf of of one community um i think at some point we will have to come back to the whole question of why is it that in a country uh in 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 a in an in a part of the world that has an entire palette of skin colors uh amongst its own peoples why is it that there is still a conscious and unconscious preference for a certain skin tone over another skin tone that's one uh the second thing is that and this has been my my most important curiosity for so long in life since all of you can see what my skin tone is and i imagine the audience can see it as well is that why is it that what what is the reason that fairer skin or lighter skin uh is in any way better <laughs> why why where 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 does virtue repose in in that having said that but before i move on to behros um you, a couple of things nirosha one is that yes uh you do um say that there are a lot of other challenges other forms of discrimination in sri lanka this is not the only one but it is only fair to say that that is true of all the other countries in the region Sri Lanka is not the only country where uh multiple forms of discrimination exist they exist in all 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 the countries and the other thing i will say um uh, in response to what you said which is an entirely personal comment is that yes these are realities of all the countries that um we are talking about and of all the countries represented here in today's panel with the exception of Myanmar I have traveled to each and every country I've been to Pakistan I've been to Sri Lanka I've been to India I've been to Nepal 
um, they're all paradises. Uh, they're all very, yeah. very beautiful. Um, I'll come back to you, Nirosha. Uh, but uh, Behroz, could I please request you, uh, Behroz and Gurpreet have been utterly, utterly patient, absolute embodiments of statues. Uh, but uh, Behroz is lecturer in Asian and American studies at the University of California, Irvine. And Behroz's research um, focuses on the Sidi community in India, who are also originally descended uh, from Africans. Um, and Behroz, if you could uh, speak now. Uh, Behroz does have a very, very short clip uh, of a film to show, but if for some reason we are unable to show it, then Behroz will simply paraphrase what that clip, clip uh, has. Okay, go for it, Behroz. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nilanjan and LSC South Asia Center for inviting me on this panel. And thank you all for being here. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker who has filmed Siddhis, Indians of African descent from 1999. And I have interacted with Siddhis from when I was seven years old. We can uh, discuss that in the Q&A section. In terms of African presence in India, a long history of flourishing trade and commerce between Africa and India goes back to the first century AD. There was voluntary migration and later Africans brought, were brought over as military soldiers and slaves. In voluntary migration, of course, they came as merchants, traders, and in different professions. There are different trajectories of migration and Africans came or were brought to India from different parts of Africa in dif different time periods. I will talk about the contemporary communities of Siddhis, especially in Gujarat and Mumbai, who are known to me personally in my research and in my filming activities. Today, majority Siddhi communities reside in the states of Gujarat and Karnataka. Contemporary communities are thought to be descendants of Africans freed by the British after the abolition of slavery around 1840s and Africans who escaped from brutal masters. Coming to the focus of today's panel, in my interactions with Siddhis, I have noted attitudes towards them that could be considered racist or especially openly discriminatory or prejudiced. And these examples are from my research and my filming activities. But at the outset, I should mention, uh, and uh, since we have permission to use the word, uh, the word Negro is commonly used in Mumbai and in Gujarat to refer to Siddhis in common everyday interactions. In Rajpipla city, Gujarat, I went to see a trustee of a school since I wanted to rent the school auditorium to do a recording of two Siddhi elderly men who sang Kavali, which is a Sufi form uh, of uh, singing. One of the artists I wanted to record, Salam Bhai Siddhi, accompanied me, but did not enter the premises. The trustee was friendly and hospitable, but on a parting note, he told me, be careful with these people. You cannot trust them. I was stunned and walked out saying, I know Siddhis from when I was seven years old and I've had no problems at all. Next, I referred to an essay by anthropologist Helena Basu, who is a foundational scholar of Siddhis of Gujarat. She was traveling on an intercity train with Siddhi women in her company to attend some festivities. A Gujarati man inquired about Helena's research and later told her, what do you see in these people? What can you talk about with them? Now, the next example is from an essay I wrote on Juliana Siddhi, who lives in Bombay and is an English speaking model coordinator uh, who lives in Mumbai. She was traveling on a local train. A woman and a man boarded at the next station. The woman sat next to Juliana a woman, uh, the woman sat next to Juliana and the man who sat across from them said in Marathi, the language spoken in Maharashtra, move away from her or her color will get onto you. 
Juliana responded immediately in Marathi, since she's the kind of person who would not let anyone get away with a comment like that. Another example from my research of interviews with Siddhis in Mumbai, a woman who works as a domestic in uh, homes in Mumbai was asked if she is a Negro, to which she responded, no, she is from Gujarat and speaks the language like the people who have employed her. Another example I quote from Juje Siddhi, Juliana's husband, who commented that while traveling on the train, several times people have asked him if they can touch his hair, which he finds offensive because he's treated as different by his racial features and not seen as an Indian citizen. More importantly, I want to comment on the subject of Hindu-Muslim conflicts in India. At present, Siddhis of Gujarat and Mumbai, and I would imagine Siddhis in Karnataka, are Muslims trapped within the current anti-Muslim environment in India, especially after the brutal attacks on Muslims in Gujarat in 2002. The Hindu majority nationalism continues to take an aggressively anti-Muslim stand. And Siddhis as Muslims in Gujarat and Mumbai are vulnerable targets. Further, a regional identity has become very popular in Indian politics, especially in Maharashtra, where Mumbai is located. Slogans like Maharashtra is for Maharashtrians, which proclaim a very strong Maratha Hindu identity are very common. I want to show a short clip from my film where a Siddhi Muslim man, Babubai, and his five wife, Fatima Ben, touch upon this issue. Um, you have made me co-host, Nilanjan. Yes, just okay. give me a and I will make you a co-host. Sorry, for some reason, I'm not being able to do that. Okay. Um, why don't you continue and oh. we'll just... Should I summarize what's yeah. said? Yeah, why don't you just continue? And if we can, right. we'll for you. Okay. So what the man says in the clip, Babu Bhai, is that I asked him that scholars come and ask you, are you African? Uh, are you Indian? What are you? Because scholars are also trying to construct them as African more and more. And in a way, it, it helps them uh, to feel some, some sense of dignity. And it also, in, within the Indian context, makes them feel as outsiders. So it is a dilemma for them as to where they belong, especially because the scheduled tribe issue is very big in India. And in Karnataka, they have been listed as scheduled tribe, which is indigenous people to India in order to get some benefits from the government. Now, in the clip, Babubai Siddhi says that I am Indian first and then I'm Siddhi. And now, of course, we have to say we are Maharashtrian because in Maharashtra, uh, a politician whose name maybe I should take um, is Bal Thakare will say, go back to where you came from. And, and his wife immediately intervenes because they are on camera and says, you shouldn't say that. And he says, no, why? It should be said. And it should be stated because they are vulnerable. Although there is a lot of laughter around this issue, it clearly states that Siddhis are vulnerable targets. Um, in some ways, the older generation of displaced and uprooted uh, Siddhis, when they came together to form a community in, in the early 1900s after the abolition of slavery and when they gravitated towards one center in Gujarat, which is around the tomb of an Abyssinian saint by the name of Bawa Gore, they experienced marginalization in so many ways, and they experienced their racialized features in terms of the prejudice against them. So they, by force of circumstances, 
tried to create an identity to remove their lowly status. They claimed that curly hair and black skin were in fact positive attributes by which they inherited a special spiritual legacy and the tradition of a fakir from their ancestral saint, Baba Gore, who is buried in Ratanpur village in Gujarat. There are no historical records of when Baba Gore came to India, but there is a record by historian Ad Dabir, who claims that this is a shrine that is sacred and was visited in the 15th century by Muhammad Khilji during one of his expeditions in Gujarat. So that is the earliest documentation. Later, there is documentation by colonials who were looking at the area for agate mines and they called the Siddhis Negroes who take care of the shrine of Baba Gore. So just to give this example that Siddhis have tried to reconstruct an identity in the, fa in the face of prejudice and racialization. But there is constant intervention in terms of calling them different names, particularly in the urban areas, Juliana and Juje Siddhi and other Siddhis like them experience on a daily basis sometimes uh, racialization. And I would like to end there and, and continue the discussion in terms of how I am involved with the Siddhis and uh, what it is like to be somebody who in your own country is discriminated against. And even though you are a citizen of the country made to feel like an outsider. Thank you very much. Thank you, Behrouz. My apologies, we couldn't uh, see the clip. Um, but could I just mention in this context and before moving to, to Gurpreet that in June this year, uh, Justice Rajiv Raina of the Punjab High Court um, informed the police who had brought a case to the court to say that a police chalan, a, com a complaint to, you know, an, an FIR, uh, first information uh, report, uh, could not use a word like Negro in it. The, the judge of the Punjab High Court directed that police forces must be sensitized to the use of words like this and that these words had uh, no place in, in, the, in, in the context of the, the legal and courtly proceedings. Now, in this particular context, the case did not involve um, Siddhis. It involved uh, some students from Sub-Saharan Africa. I think they were from Nigeria. I can't remember very clearly. Um, but uh, it, the, the whole question of the terminology is also very, very important, as is important the question of ethnic features at the extreme other end of the spectrum from where Nurang Rina was speaking, which is to say that it is about it is it is about where and how we begin to allow identification processes to kick in completely unconsciously uh, to and, and, and trigger certain forms of behavior. I now have the pleasure of inviting Gulpreet Kaur, um, who is a writer and a young activist and advocates for multicultural inclusion within the Sikh community and leads the Black Sikh Initiative, which Gulpreet, you will speak about. Um, it, it is not out of place for me to say over here that uh, it, it, in many, many ways, uh, Gulpreet's presence in this panel discussion captures in a very essential way, all the things that all of us from multiple perspectives have been talking about, uh, which is when someone who becomes part of a community by choice, no doubt because of being uh, attracted to that community for entirely personal reasons, is then confronted with another gamut of reactions, which were no doubt equally unexpected. 
uh, Gurpreet leads this, this very interesting uh, initiative called the Black Sikh Initiative. And uh, Gurpreet will speak partly about her own experience, but will also speak about the Black Sikh Initiative, because I think it's very important that we also, you know, before we get onto the discussion, uh, look at what are the ways in which we can begin to address uh, this very complicated situation. Gurpreet. Yes, thank you, Nalajan. Um, and I will go off of your last point, actually. Um, for me, I wish that when I had come into the predominantly Punjabi Sikh community, that I had a video to reference like this, kind of to bring me up on the situation in South Asia. Um, and so I hadn't gone into the situation as naive as I did. <laughs> But um, yeah, I my name is Gurpreet. My legal name is Jasmine, but in Sikh spaces, I go by Gurpreet. Um, and I am one of the co-founders of the Black Sikh Initiative, along with Brianna Sukhmani Kaur. She's my partner in crime. <laughs> and uh, BSI is a grassroots organization that educates, motivates, and empowers Black Sikh activists, as well as our white and brown allies to combat racism, casteism, and colorism, which like, some of y'all have already said, there's a lot of intersectionality between all of those things. Um, and I think it's important to break down the vocabulary in that sentence. When we say Black Sikh activists, I like to note that we are not a representative for all Black Sikhs, because it's interesting when it comes to our initiative, when it comes to the younger Black Sikhs, so I would say people like me who are in college, late 20s, maybe early 30s. They're very supportive of our initiative. But interestingly enough, when it comes to the older ones, um, I'll say they've gotten comfortable with the status quo and they don't want to rock the boat, basically. So I find that as an interesting or, um, dilemma. And then also I say our white and brown allies, which um, one thing me and both my founder have talked about is that we're not necessarily trying to change minds, even though that's like a good thing. Um, we are empowering people within our community who actually do want to create change and stuff. So I think that's the best way to go about it in my opinion. So why do we do what we do? Well, one the reason is because we know what Gurbani, which is like the Sikh scriptures say, and we know the institutions that the Sikh gurus established, like for example, one is Lunger, and literally the reason why Lunger was established was to break those caste divisions that were going on in Indian society at the time. Um, and I will even say the good war itself was established as an institution for egalitarian treatment of all people from all different backgrounds, races, castes, etc. Um, and stuff like that. Second reason is that there is no organization or platform within the C community that I know of who is exclusively focusing on this issue. Now, sure, there's some organizations within the community who they'll maybe do a talk or like a meeting about it like every now and then, or they've done it once or twice, but they really do not address it. Um, and the third thing, which this goes into what I just said, a lot of Sikhs in our, com in our community are compliant. So again, we have the discussions about the equality and even, you know, I've been on several podcasts. I know several other Black Sikhs who have been on several podcasts and talks who have talked about their experiences, but it's more so like, a, oh, we feel so bad for you and then nothing's done. Um, and what's interesting to me, the talks don't even ask about how our community can fix these issues. It's more so like, oh, what's your experience? And then there's no like action plan afterwards. So that's all the reasons why we do what we do. Um, issues we have faced since we started the initiative, because we started back in July, 2020. We find that for the C community, image is a huge thing when it comes to portraying ourselves to the outside communities or whatever. You know, Sikhs are very concerned about um, appearing 
almost like angels, these saviors, these, you know, just we can do no wrong, <laughs> basically image. Um, and so because of that, they try to push a false narrative. And one example of this is interestingly enough, when we started our initiative, we were getting together pictures and stories of um, Black Sikhs in our community who want to be part of the initiative. And we also got to get other material about discriminatory experiences within the community, et cetera. And what's interesting is that we noticed over social media, people started sharing photos of Black Sikhs. And the interesting thing is that, at least for me, I'm very in the know about who the whoever is Black in the Sikh community. I'm, I'm for the most part, I know most of the people who are. Um, and so when I see the photos, I look at one photo, I'm like, okay, that's not a person who identifies as a Sikh. That's a person who practices yoga. And then I see another photo and I did some deep research into it. Those people aren't Sikh. They were literally just at a turpentine event. And then there's, I see another photo and um, I'm like, oh, that person doesn't practice Sikh anymore. They're not a part of the community anymore. So, you know, it's like they share it and it's they try to create this false narrative and it's, it's, not, it's not true. So a second issue we face is um, attacking the victim slash distancing themselves from the oppressor, which this is a huge one. Basically, oh, those Sikhs who do it, they are not Sikhs or those are fake Sikhs. Well, in my, from my perspective, I'm like, okay, so these are apparently fake Sikhs, they're not Sikhs but you let them serve on the Gurdwara committees, you let them in positions of seva and volunteer service, being sevadars and stuff, but apparently they're still fake Sikhs, you know what I'm saying? So, um, which I'll talk about that more later on how that can be addressed. Um, and attacking the victim, basically, there's two things I've seen. The first thing is basically, oh, just read Gurbani, which is like the Sikh religious scriptures, and ignore the discrimination, you know, just ignore it, you know, you'll be fine, just read your body. And anybody who knows about Sikh history, Sikh thought and um, Sikh religious thought knows that spirituality is important, very important in our community, but also the political activism is very important in our community, actually fighting against oppression, that's very important. But for some reason, and this is really across the board when it comes to all issues within the community, um, the spirituality has been embraced, but the activism has completely gone down in, in all aspects across the community. And so really for me, this has been me embracing both my spirituality and the activist part of uh, the Sikh tradition. And then also another response is usually, um, you know, just get out of our community. That is definitely another response I have seen. Um, and then the third issue we faced is people putting focus on other issues. So you will have Sikhs will, who will say, well, what about 1984? And we're like, well, there are organizations and activists already several who are fighting for that issue, right? We're the only ones fighting this issue in the community that we see. So, you know, those are the issues that we face. And how do we combat them? Well, just keep doing what we're doing. That's simply how we combat that issue. Um, and what we're currently working on, we're working on a pledge campaign, which is going to release New Year's um, ally network that we're trying to do that around Vaisakhi. So that's like April. And then after I graduate from my undergraduate program, in May, I really want to go do like an observational research tour of good wars in the United States because I'm based out of Texas. So um, just to get that data together, um, that's something I'm really passionate about. And we, there's also several other things because of COVID, they've been pushed to the side. <laughs> so those are the things we're doing. And lastly, how can you support marginalized communities but then you're respected either like religious community or like even secular community. First thing, take on positions of power and influence in your community. 
you know, going back to the Sikh community and using this as an example, being the one who distributes longer, you might not think that's like a big deal, but it actually is because um, we've had people experience this where they'll go to longer and they're denied longer because either their race or their caste or some other like um, reason connected to their ancestry. Um, and so when you're that person, when you're that ally who are in those positions, you can make sure that doesn't happen, if you get what I'm saying. Second thing, be friendly. <laughs> there's some good wires that go in. People are very, very friendly. And then there's some good wires that come, that I go in. And Brianna, my uh, partner in crime, she describes it perfectly. It's like you're a ghost. <laughs> it's like you don't exist or something. And then there's some good wires you go in that like, the stares are horrible. Like people are staring and obviously talking about you and stuff like that. So being friendly, that's a huge thing. And lastly, when it comes to visual projects, so any awareness campaigns you do about your religious community or your secular community, um, be sure to incorporate those people in those projects because representation does matter. Um, and we're working on that when it comes to actually the pledge campaign that we're doing this New Year's. But yeah, again, thank you for listening to my talk about BSI. And thank you, uh, Nilajan, for inviting me to this talk. Not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your, your experiences. Um, you, you know, as, as an adoptive uh, insider, uh, and I use the word adoptive in no pejorative or, or distancing way, but from the vantage point, a powerful vantage point of having come into something from the outside into the inside. And as I will in the, in the remaining 20 odd minutes that we have, I should, I should begin with thanking um, our audience. We, we have a very solid and loyal body of 55 people who are watching us from the beginning. And then it's gone up to 80, 85, and then it has fluctuated, but we seem to have 55 we've held on to, which is remarkable. And, and Gurpreet, for all the blame you put on, on, on COVID-19, it is only because of COVID-19 that I'm able to convene this gathering, because otherwise at LSE, we do on-site events, and I could never have brought all of you together uh, like this. Um, that doesn't make uh, the whole COVID experience any better or more desirable. Um, I'm going to ask Malini to, to say a few uh, words, just your, your, your instant reaction to, to what you've heard. We, we've gone through a gamut. A lot of it is disturbing. Some of it is encouraging, like what Nirosha said about the very new generation um, of, of, of people who, who take pride in being uh, what they are or what Gurpreet has said about how, how change can be brought in. But there are also a lot of internal dynamics that are mutually contradictory. And one of the things that is definitely worth discussing briefly is that the, the whole question of prejudicial practices in the plural, because let we are all agreed that there is no one, one practice. Uh, uh, a lot of it is so terribly internalized. It's, it's so, so dangerously internalized and routinized and normalized that people can actually say that, oh, I meant it as a joke. I'm your friend. That's why I call you Kalu. I mean, sorry, could you imagine doing that in another context? This is one uh, that I would definitely, uh, Malini, like you to, to, to respond to briefly in the context of what, what we have heard. The other is, and this is especially given, given you know, uh, your, your, your position at the moment at the, the Anti-Research Research and Policy Center, is that South Asians of all hues, of all hues, are extremely quick and agile at identifying racism when and where they are experiencing it themselves. But refuse to identify it as racism when they're doing precisely 
exactly the same thing to another person. It's, I mean, I, in, in the concept note that I had written, which is up on our website even now, uh, when I put this together, my, my principal concern was what I had pegged this entire discussion on was not the practices itself, but the unreflexivity of South Asians in this context, where you can identify it. It's not that you can't identify it, but you don't seem to give it the same name when you do precisely the same things. Yep. But Malini, why don't you go for it? Uh, one last thing that I would like to bring into play, uh, and I would like all of you to respond very, very briefly to it, is do you think there is a gender aspect to this? Do you think women are more vulnerable to racial prejudice uh, than men are? Or do you think that that is not so men, women, it is just blanket, et cetera? Um, so, so that'll be a useful um, uh, uh, comment to have from all of you from your individual perspectives. I should say, I should say that um, in the comments that we have got on Facebook, we've actually not got a single question, but rather sadly, a lot of the comments which are very, very supportive all seem to acknowledge that this is a fact and that this doesn't get discussed. I think that is just very sad in itself. I, I you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for each and every comment that has come in, but it's, it's something that, that we really need to take further. But Malini, why don't you speak now? Thank you so much for those incredibly powerful contributions, my fellow panelists. Um, I'd like to start with something that uh, Sue Yadanar said um, when she was talking about use of terms like Kala and Kalamar uh, in Myanmar. And, and what she said is these terms are completely normalized in society. People think it's okay to say them, but it is not okay. And um, I think what she's saying there is the imperative of us to interrupt racism, right? To interrupt it in the interpersonal forms, to interrupt it in the ways that it's perpetuated structurally, legally, to interrupt it when, uh, when people are displaying bias by stares or by you know, other types of hostility of the kind that uh, Gurpreet uh, mentioned. Um, and so, so that, that notion of interrupting, you know, while, I, while I love the thought of being friendly, I, I feel like at some times it's also very difficult to, be, um, to do this in a kind of compassionate way. And I, and I wonder that tension there. I, am, I went to high school in Southern India, um, in Kodekanal, is a hill station where um, there are a lot of students um, from the Northeast, from, from Nagaland. Um, and from, from um, Nepal and Tibet as well, um, borderland regions. And you know those slurs that were mentioned by uh, Gurung Rina are exactly what I heard all the time. And participating in a sports day event, I remember at one point hearing those slurs at my friends. And I turned around and I said, that is racist. And I then used a cuss word um, to the person who was saying it. And I was so angry. And um, I remember I was 16 years old at the time. And, I, and, and just sort of that anger that I felt at hearing my friends being called that term, you know, and I, I, I just, I feel that there's a tension about being friendly and just being angry. And, and I just wanna put that out there because there, there's no other emotion sort of that I have. And, and I don't directly experience that, but I just feel so angry for, for friends and, and colleagues of mine. Um, I wanna come back to something that, um, Hormat said, which is so powerful, the idea of being both part of the state and, and, and the reproduction of power, as well as um, on the periphery of the state and the subject of ethnic discrimination, right? That dialectic between being within law, right, within policy, within the state, but also sort of being outside of it and cast, and, and, and cast aside or being a subject of, of discrimination and, and sitting outside it is this really this tension that I actually found throughout. Um, so Lauren Rina said uh, something that I'll remember, I think, always is that racism is impossible to call out in the political language of the law in India, right? It's impossible to call out in the political language of the law because there is, are no laws that specifically uh, persecute prosecute on the basis of racism um, and the extent to which it's it's normalized as we saw in Vero's Shroff's 
uh, you know, ethnographic and ex experiential stories of, of being of filming um, uh, Africana descendant groups of Nirosha's uh, experiences, right, with uh, with groups and the internalization of, of, of people who don't want to be called kafir, it's so normalized, right, that, that, that it's very difficult even to put a legal framework around this. Um, so I, you know, so I just, I just want to kind of put out there um, that, that there's this dialectical tension between within the system and outside of the system and how do we fight these things? How do we interrupt racism through those dialectics, through those dialectical strategies, right? Um, and um, and then I I, I love something that uh, that um, uh, Gurpreet said at, at the end um, in her comments. She said we we're not necessarily trying to change minds. We're empowering people within our communities who want to create change. And I, for me, that's exactly the principle that I live by as well. You know, I'm not interested in in sort of extending a hand to some of my white colleagues in America who sort of don't accept and acknowledge that that anti-black racism exists or don't you know don't really feel like they want to give it a name or um, I'm actually interested in uplifting amplifying people who are trying to to create change and so I think that's something that that um, was very powerful for me thank you very much um, thank you uh, Malini I'm going to uh, give preference to 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 Narang to Suya Danar and to Hurmat and Gurpreet over Nirosha and Behiroz because I want to focus on each of you uh, individually, but just very quickly in yes or no, or with one or two sentences so we can move on. Is there a gender aspect to it? Nurang Rina, would you like to start? Is there a gender aspect to it? Do you think women are more susceptible with, in any case within traditional patriarchal male dominated societies? Do you think women are, or do you think, as in the case of the, uh, the, the very, very unfortunate and sad case of the, uh, the, 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 the young man from Arunachal who was killed, uh, you know, it is also something that can happen to uh, men because of the, all the research that I, I did, the background research that I did in preparation for this, I was struck by the fact of the number of examples of people being beaten, all related to men. And I say all related to men because I was actually making a note of it, okay? Whereas the, 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 the majority of uh, examples, and these are all newspaper and media reports that I was reading, uh, of um, verbal abuse, that there, there was a tilt in favor of women. Of course, men were also, uh, you know, victims of verbal abuse. Uh, but but do you want to speak briefly on do you, do you think uh, gender makes a difference, or do you think that is uh, that is just a media imbalance that I am reading? You need to switch on your mic. Yeah, go for it. Thank you, thank you, Professor, for. Uh highlighting that aspect because that is what exactly I uh, left to speak about at the end uh, before we conclude because uh, I mean race related violence uh, does not spare anyone any any minority however I think in terms of uh, experiences as male and female it's very different uh, uh, what you what you highlighted just now about men being beaten and the you know the culture of uh, uh, physical violence being, uh, uh, you know, meted out to men is, is, is alarming. And I think that is to do with, uh, you know, uh, calling out masculinity of men and uh, trying to belittle them as not being masculine enough or, or, or to put it in a very casual way. Um, the Hindi word mardangi is something that I recall is because uh, men from the Northeast to the rest of the India is is or or, or, or is seen as um, not being men enough, you know. Um, but for women, I think there is a constant uh, exoticization and sexualization, uh, and and therefore it really works uh, differently for male and female. Like in in all the experiences that I've had in this many years, and all my friends and colleagues, I think it would be fair to say how uh, gender plays. A very important role, or, or rather, to bring in Kimberly's uh, concept of intersectionality, where you know, uh, you know, all these factors does really, uh, 
I think, allow different kind of uh, experiences as men and women from different right. ethnic or communities. Sure. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly rushing because I know Malini has to leave very soon. But before we continue, and we really have to finish in four or five minutes, unfortunately, is that, and you know, having these discussions, this is always the problem, no amount of time is enough. But could I please to start with, uh, thank all of you individually for having agreed to participate. We couldn't have had this discussion without any um, of you. And, and I'm really personally, as well as on behalf of the LSE South Asia Center, very grateful that, that you have, that, that you all agreed. These are not easy things to talk about. Talking about personal experiences is exposing, uh, you know, some of your biggest weaknesses, uh, uh, and, and uh, sorry, not your biggest weaknesses, but your weakest points to, to the public and to an international and an invisible audience. You cannot see your own audience. This could, couldn't have been easy, but I do sincerely hope that all of you felt that this was a conversation worth having. And perhaps we should seriously consider something that Malini said to me in an earlier email when we were communicating, is that whether we should think about doing something as a follow on to see where you know, this could possibly take us, but that, that is for later. Um, I, will, I will skip all of you in terms of the gender answer, but I will want to introduce one very important question here. Again, it is for South Asians as a collective to think. South Asians who are South Asians either by birth or natality or are South Asians by adoption, because that is as much of a complicated journey to make as in the case of Gurpreet, is that would this discussion have been different if I was a white man wanting to do this discussion? If I was a white man thinking, thinking that, oh, I seem to notice this when I travel in South Asia, when I interact with South Asian people. And uh, it's amazing. No one seems to talk about it and no one seems to, to, to debate it. And I'm afraid that my gut feeling, and, and we'll end with this, I'm not going to ask any of you for an answer. Uh, I'm going to end with this, is that my gut feeling is that the conversation would take on a completely different dynamic because each person would then respond to my status and my identification, not as a concerned and embodied uh, individual in South Asia, but as a white person wanting to have a discussion presumed to be on his or her own terms. And I, I raised this question because I think it is as important for us as South Asians to think about why we would participate in a discussion about racism in countries like the United States, where some of you live, in, in, in the United Kingdom, in England, where I live, and we would go up and say, oh yes, I have faced racism or that there is institutionalized racism, but we wouldn't talk about it in terms of the way in which Naran Rina was talking about, which is that institutionalized racism functions in one's own countries as well. That these, these structures of prejudices and, and its outflows that seep into every crack and crevice is, is it, is, uh, an everyday real and lived experience and an extremely disturbing one. Uh, I have taken some hope from what Nirosha has said and some hope from what Gurpreet has said, even with the, the very difficult um, remedy of having to be friendly, which I dare say would come very, very hard in a situation like this. But I have to also say that of the various things that I have done for so many years, this has to be one of the most difficult discussions that I have convened. Um, and and to, to hear firsthand the, the, you know, the extent, uh, the complexity, and the, 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 the completeness of the nature of these discriminations uh, and the only thing that I think we can do and we should do and we ought to do is to talk about it more publicly 
in on public platforms so that people become aware of the fact that people within the community are concerned about this. Because I think that is a consciousness that, that is missing. In, a, in, in nations that have such a variety of skin tones in them and have such a variety of, you know, it's not even an upper caste, lower caste thing alone. There are a lot of dark skinned upper caste people you know, it, it, it is nowhere that upper caste people are all fair and lower caste people are all dark and, and et cetera, et cetera. And in part, uh, and this was something that both Behrouz and Madani mentioned uh, in, differently, is it is also a question of the very complex uh, colonial inheritances that, that we uh, carry with ourselves. Uh, but on that note, and thank you very much once again, everyone, each one of you individually, all of you collectively, thank you very much and goodbye from London. <laughs>